Yeah, so I'll start with a little summary. The markets were red. Commodities were basically red, except gas. Dollar was up and rates were essentially down, just sideways down, hovering near their highs. So let's look at them in more detail. Very quickly, the S&P. Look at that, you know, close near low of day. Down almost a percent. NASDAQ, same sort of thing. Down 1%. Just off that low there, that kilo of the last two trading days. But I, I really think we're going to breach this. I don't know if it's Monday or Tuesday, but 30, 360. The close below that, we're going to go lower, 355, and then essentially three, 350 or below. I think we're going to get to 348-ish, roughly that zone. So I'm watching the NASDAQ more than the S&P because the NASDAQ has led the markets higher. So I think it makes sense that it leads the markets lower. But the S and I think you know you see this horizontal line. To me, makes sense to revisit the actual breakout zone, and actually to venture lower because I think if the Nasdaq goes lower, the S and P has to go a bit lower than this horizontal. So I'm reckoning I'm looking for the S and P to around four two six fifty ish that zone. Nasdaq, yeah, down towards here. Let's call it three fifty to keep it simple. Not in one go, you know. First of all, bounce at three five five ish. But ultimately, below 350, now the Dow Jones, look how more bearish this looks. And this makes sense. The Dow and the Russell have been weaker for, for months, actually. Look at this close below this horizontal. And this horizontal is kind of a short term. You know, when you zoom out, you can see why I placed it there. It was resistance, resistance, and then bam, breaks out and it actually bounces here. So for me, it's kind of significant that it closed below. Just even though it didn't, you know, the Dow wasn't lower than the S&P or the NASDAQ, but that's typical on down days and on up days. You know, it doesn't move as much, but still, I think technically on the chart, it's just had a pretty ugly close. And yeah, if the NASDAQ and the S&P go lower, then this has to go lower. You know, I don't know, 33,500 for, for, for starter, and then we'll see if we go, go much lower. Uh, I'm actually, again, just looking at the NASDAQ mainly. The Russell, look at this. I said it belonged right here. That's exactly where it ended up. Uh, actually, it's the first time I'm looking at the Russell uh, close, let's say, from Friday. So, you know, this has been probably the weakest. It breached higher. You can see why I've had these two trend lines here for, for ages, actually. And then we wrestled above this zone here. But look, you know, the markets were extended. They had to calm down. They did. And now we're between these sort of tram lines and... Yeah, if the markets go a little bit lower, then I reckon the Russell will probably, I hate putting too many lines, but, you know, probably go there, probably there's a bit of a gap zone, see this resistance on this day, support on this day, so probably bounce there. And you know what, if we go even lower, then we strip back down here, 171, 172 zone, absolute lows before the all-time, well, not the absolute, but, you know, the third line of defense. So for me, the Russell is very, very weak still, uh, due to the banking stocks also. So, you know, NASDAQ and Russell, those are probably the two markets to watch, regardless of what you're trading. Okay, now let's move to the banks, which look very much like the Russell, that's always the case. The seniors, yeah, you know, think of how much stocks, tech stocks have moved up and we've just sort of not even been able to really clear this zone here. So, you know, and the banks were pretty weak the last few days. I mean, which makes sense because the markets were down, but they were still down more than the markets. So now this is the senior banks, XLF. Yeah, okay, we held this zone. You can see if we have any move low, we're going to start filling this gap, 32. So I expect it to go there. And if it goes any lower, we're you know risking a close below this ascending and then straight back down to the absolute lows, which probably would coincide with another banking failure. There's a way for these charts to coincide with real news. At the right time, KBE, by the way, this becomes irrelevant now. Yeah, look at this. So it's lost the ascending, very weak, and the KBE and the KRE always identical these days, although the KRE is slightly weaker. But look, uh, back to the KBE, lost the ascending. Yes, you can say it's trying to curl here because it broke out of the descending curl, go back up. Yeah, it could, you know, one or two days curl. But if the markets keep going lower, sorry, you're just going to have to keep going lower. See what 34, maybe even a little bit below. By then, this descend becomes irrelevant. 
it's a failure. It could bounce a little bit because the market's will bounce. You can't go down more than four, five, six trading days in a row. But I think it'll be just too, too little, too late. You know, we'll have a weak little bounce and then probably worth just drawing this because it's asking me to imagine too much. But a little bounce and then one more drop, bam, we're all the way back down again. So that's what I reckon is the big risk for the banking stocks. The KBE uh, and the KRE, you know, normally you'd expect a small bounce here and there could be a little bounce in the markets because they come down big, but I just, I actually see a bit more downside. So if there is a small bounce, I still expect the markets to go low. And again, it'll be the same thing. Actually, that looks quite nice, but you know what I mean? There's just one or two days delay otherwise. So I still think the markets, but I've been thinking the markets will go lower for a while. But to be honest, look at the banking stocks. We're very close to the to the edge, you know. So although Nvidia and all these stocks have had a great time, if the banks go down a little bit more, the whole market and the economy goes down um faster than they already are. Because let's be honest, we we are definitely in a recession, in my opinion. Okay, the KRE, no point in reiterating what I've already said in the KBE because it's the exact same chart. So this ascending, to be honest, I might as well delete it because it's failed to do what it should have done. So again, you know, small move down, then maybe a little bit of a, a bounce, dead cap bounce, and then all the way back down again. And then look how scary it is. We're talking about March 2020 lows being flushed. You know, if we get back down here and we start to go lower, we are at March 2020 lows, just with more debt and more problems. So that's the markets and the banks. Let's check out interest rates that were red on Friday. But look, the one year is just hovering sideways at the absolute highs. So you cannot call that bearish. Uh, you know, even if it sort of closed below this ascending, which will take maybe another week's worth of trading, I still think we'll just go down a little bit and eventually higher. I think rates are going higher. Two year, you know. A bit of a pause, maybe a small drop, but higher. Sorry, I just don't see why it would change. I mean, look what the Fed said. No rate cuts for years. I don't believe that, but still, that should send us higher. And look at the inflation numbers, you know, not just in America, but in Europe. It's just always a surprise to the upside. So higher, higher, higher. Five-year, just lagging the two-year a little bit, but higher. Again, it was sideways red. Ten-year, look, you can see how weak it gets here. Just another reiteration of the yield curve inversion. So yeah, if they do go a little bit more sideways, you could imagine the 10 year getting a bit weaker and then it would start to look like this descending was really, let's go with this one. This descending here was really acting correctly, you know, just stalling here. The more days it stalls, the more likely a drop will take more time to recover. But also look at the 30 year, quite weak actually hasn't really gone up so but that's just more yield curve inversion that's inflate uh inflation yeah yeah it is also an indication of inflation to some extent but it's recession um confirmation if you say so this is uh bad news for the fed let's look at the european ones it was just read across the board for the world's uh bonds but i mean no yields but I don't see any risk of this ascending actually collapsing. Can I do this? Maybe. I just feel like the 10-year will, uh, will just make new highs, the EU 10-year. And the British, which is a little different. Yeah, they're just going sideways. I mean, they've had a hell of a run, generally speaking. So a bit of sideways action, but fundamentally no change and technically no real change. So up we go. Next week, we'll probably have a green week overall. So rates up. It was a down day, but basically up is still the pattern let's look at the dollar yeah for me i thought it would hold 102 and i needed a few more days to see if it could bounce from 102 because you know we had this you know we were going up here we had a breakout that was pretty obvious we moved higher than where will it fail well i always thought between this zone this descending and 105 slash 106 we find a bit of resistance. We did. We found it early. And then we dropped. But look, we've curled at 102. Because I was making videos where it was below 102. But I thought 102 would hold, would hold. And it did. And look at this close here on Friday. That kind of indicates 102 is the zone. So for me, 102 is the support to lose. So we're curling. And now, you know, and I'm not going to do this. You know, you could say, oh, now we've got a little ascending. We've got a little you know, a tight wedge to play from, but I don't really want to do that. Let's keep it simple. 
we've got 100.8 or 101, let's just say 101. And we've got this descending. That's Those are the zones to push. You know, I'm not looking at the 50, the 200, forget all that. Which way do we close above or below? Now we can be in this range for a while, but I just feel like we're going to break out one way or the other sooner than expected. Because to be honest, these markets are always breaking out sooner than expected for me. You know, sometimes I think something's going to take two weeks and it takes honestly two days. And we have big news every day. So, I mean, look at the, <clears throat> look at the, the fake coup or failed coup, whatever you want to call it in, um, in Russia that happened literally over the weekend. So by the time markets open on Monday, it's almost like nothing happened, but you could almost say, uh, well, maybe not for the dollar, but you know, you could have some markets move as an aftermath to what happened. But yeah, back to the DXY. I think these are the two trend lines, this descending, this horizontal. I think 102 is the support for now. I don't know what to expect. Monday will have a small retracement, but I think 102 will hold. And if we visit anywhere, it's going to be 104. And then it's about where do we close? I think a close above 104.5 will be very significant because by then you're probably outside of this descending and you've cleared the high that failed so many times here. And also it'd be the best close since, you know, all the way over here. So I'd say 104.5 and then a close below 102 will send you to the absolute low. So the DXY is getting very interesting. This is getting tight. At the moment, it's coiled and looks for a nice pop though, you know. When you zoom out, what have we done? We've had a crazy movement in DXY. We've had a massive retracement. And now we're coiled for a pop. Fundamentally, the DX, the, the dollar is, is, you know, it's got many problems, it's flawed, but compared to all the other currencies, as usual, it may just rally. I mean, look at the Turkish lira, for example, that thing is just a devastation. Okay, that's the DXY. Let's look at commodities. So this is actually quite interesting. Look at copper. Copper resistance for me was just below four, so 3.95-ish. You can see why these tails here touched it next day smack back down that's probably the dollar strength to be honest i yes the markets were lower but it was going up despite the markets being lower so for me the dxy is what affected copper now to the downside honestly i find it so hard to read copper um at least zoomed in technically fundamentally it deserves to be all the way up long term i'll get that out of the way but uh, i would just say this ascending even though we ventured below it we just sort of seem to reclaim i can imagine the ascending playing a role for support if we were to go lower you know imagine when one or two days might go down here if it does go down and this low this 3.74 ish so will probably end up being where the ascending support is too so i would say low 3.7s is support and then after that honestly honestly if we flush then it's just going to be this horizontal 3.55 so uh, I don't usually do this, but you know, here for example, and I'm not even in copper. I mean, I own some mines that probably um uh, have copper residue, but those are the two zones on the downside, really. And on the upside, I don't see any upside breakout, but you know, obviously the last high, so let's call it 3.95 ish, and then after that, straight up to 4.12 to 4.19 or something. We're not going to get there soon. So now gas, possibly the only obviously bullish asset out there. And I, what I like about gas is it doesn't really care what's going on in the rest of the, the assets. You know, all oh, the dollars up, don't care. Is oil up or down? Is, you know, how's the NASDAQ? How's NVIDIA? How's gold? Don't care. We've got our own supply and demand uh, influences and we've got our own chart and we just don't care. And geopolitics may play a role, but other than that, um, it's a lone gunman. So look at this, we've just completely collapsed, obviously, the last couple of months. You could say one, yeah, a couple of months at least. Now we've been in this tight range. We've had this two, two zone holding, more 210 to be honest, been holding. It's very hard to read this chart because, you know, we bounce, we retrace the whole move. That's weird. 
then we bounced very little and then it looked like we were going to collapse because what a weak bounce that was triple bottoms they very rarely hold then you know out from the, the depths of hell we just claw our way out and rise all the way up here that was that's rare in trading i would say at least for me and then it looks like okay we've made our decision and i remember saying that at the time and then we just completely collapse again almost to the absolute lows again that's just again very weird and now this time we've risen again from the absolute lows although this time you can you know it's quite obvious it looks very strong. Look at these big candles. This big retracement has just eaten up the next two days. And we're out of this descending, number one. Okay, I could delete it. It just looks good. And it's just a good reminder that we're out of it. Honestly, I could delete this now because it's obsolete. But we've closed, you know, several times above this descending. But more importantly, we've closed above the latest high, this horizontal zone. So for me, and I think I mentioned 2.8, but... Now we go to three, and to be honest, when we get to three, yeah, you could have a small. Let me do this, actually, because it will serve me well when we get there, and we will get there very soon, I think. We And also look at the close, you know, at a high of day, pretty much, and above this zone. So it's not that we ventured above and closed below. We ventured above and stayed above. We go up there, we have one or two days where we just, you know, go back for some air or something, but bam, straight up. And honestly, there at that point, you know, shorts will cover, momentum traders will pile in, etc., etc. It won't happen in one go, but I just feel like we'll get to, yeah, four, then another retracement. I don't know how hard that'll be, but I do feel like we have to close the gap. And again, zoom out. Is that really impossible? Now, I didn't think I would draw these lines for some time, but for me, four is an obvious zone. And so is the gap fill, and so is prior support above the gap fill. So let me just draw that in. Doesn't have to be too precise right now, but you know what I mean? Break out of this, we run, we touch four, we just go sideways again, just like it's been just like we're gonna go sideways here, sideways down. I mean. And then yeah, we'll probably just venture a little bit below. We're not gonna sorry, I'm gonna do that. You know, we'll probably hit the we close the gap and then go back down again to the, the beginning of the gap. I don't know. But I do feel like we will actually touch 5, 5.5-ish, you know. But we're very far from that. That's 100% move from here. So, but, I mean, look, it happens quickly, you know. And um, I think the European gas price went up and geopolitically, supply demand-wise, everything is very bullish, and technically, so this is great, and this is starting to look very bullish, so natural gas just looks amazing. Okay, oil. Yeah, oil. Just when I thought that it was starting to make a very strong stance down here, and it did again, to be honest, on Friday, look at this close, basically flat, after venturing even below 68. There's a lot of strength down here. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to flush this 64 zone. It just looks like it wants to do it so much. But every time it ventures down here, very strong buy. So I would say, you know, it depends how you are as a trader. Me, I'm not even in oil except one oil stock. But I would just buy one lot here. First tranche here. And even buy it straight away here, 69.4. Just buy. And then if it does break 64, buy more. I mean, not... Not on the same day, you know, maybe see how far it goes. And there could be another strong head fake, just like it does here every time, you know, it just goes down and then rallies and has a green day. You could have that if it fake, if it takes out 64, you know, just all the way down to 60 and then big rally to 65. And then we're back into this zone. I can imagine that actually just back into the ascending channel, even though we touched like 59.8 on the same day, it closes at 65.10, you know. So I would just buy here and then buy the flush and then buy more. It depends. I, I usually buy in four or five tranches as I've done with gas. And um, I just feel like down here is a good buy, but I, I, I'm i aware that it could easily close below it and flush. So, but oil is very interesting. I, you know, oil, gas, copper, and uranium, they're all interesting. Look at uranium. I thought this would happen. I mean, I was very, very greedy. I thought it would actually flush, didn't. I got what I deserve, which is nothing whilst the price run up. Then there's a bit of an exhaustion candle. We've come back down to test 
a descending breakout. This is typical. It's also a test of this horizontal breakout. Look how strong it's been. These big candles, you need to come back and test it, which is what we've done here. What would be perfect if it went just a little lower and tested this horizontal and then went back up. But imagine you've got your buy here and then it never goes there and just goes back up. You've missed it just for, you know, 0.3% per move. So if you want to buy your aim, and I do want to buy your aim, but um, I have my eyes elsewhere. You know, I'm in gas, oil, so, uh, gas, gold, silver, um, and, and other stocks. I just, for me, I'm not going to chase this, even though it's not really a chase because I think it's going to go all the way up long term. But I really want uranium to come down to where I want it. Otherwise, I'm not interested because I don't want this on my mind if it starts to... Again, I would buy one lot. If it comes back down, again, I would, I would see how much money I want to allocate to it. And I wouldn't even be buying this. I'd be buying uranium stocks. So I'd have to start looking at which uranium stocks I want, like Aramco, uh, Cameco. I always get those two uh, stocks mixed up. But Cameco and others, I've got a list of about 15. Uh, I just don't have the time, you know. And he who is focused everywhere is weak everywhere, to quote Sun Tzu. And I just feel like I've got, I hold like 20, 25 stocks. So... Basically, I miss it down here, and I'm only going to be interested if it comes all the way back down. And for that to happen, I reckon, I reckon the market has to crash. So I would love to buy uranium on a market crash, um, but I'd be buying a lot of things, I think, on a, on a market crash. But for those out there who are in uranium or who are interested in my technical analysis of it, I think the revisiting of this zone, these two trend lines, the descending and the horizontal, is great. This is a good place to add. But of course, you know, it is possible for it to flush again. But for that to happen, I think the market needs to go down. Uh, and I don't know how much the dollar will affect uranium, actually. I think uranium is a bit like gas. Sometimes it doesn't really care about the dollar. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I think it's more about the market. So, but uranium, very nice revisit. Good buy zone. Okay, gold and silver. Like out of the new trend line, this, this one down here. For me... Gold is weak. Gold is weak. Silver is weak. The dollar, I think, will actually go up. It did have an update on Friday. Gold and silver actually also had an update pretty much on Friday. So that was interesting. It happens, you know. So despite the dollar strength, gold and silver held pretty much. Uh, but then again, the markets were down, you know, and I've said that it's all about the markets and the dollar. If the markets go down, it helps gold and silver. And if the dollar goes down, it helps gold and silver. In this case, you had, you know, dollar up, which is bad for gold and silver. But then you have the market down, which is good for gold and silver. In the end, the market had more effect. So gold and silver had a little bit of a green day. I don't know how much of this trend line, it could just be coincidence. I just saw it and placed it. For me, I just think we're going to go lower. I think that we were too weak here. And we needed a flush, and I don't think a flush means a little $20 drop. I think it needs, you know, 50 or uh, more. You know, I, I just stick with my 1880 ish, 1900 needs to be visited. I mean, look, we were touching 1912, 1911. Why not hit 1900? And then once we're at 1900, you know, they're going to pierce it and get everyone to flush it down to 1886, and then it goes back up and blah, blah, blah. But I just feel like we need to visit, like, 1800s, 1800 and something. I don't know where it is. In silver, I think it will be the ascending, definitely. It could just be 2150. I keep thinking about 2150. I think by the time we get there, you know, look, and I hate adding too many lines, I know, but look, can you see this zone here? It was kind of a zone back here, holding, holding. Yes, we flushed below, but we closed above, and then bam. And here we rallied, but okay, we're a bit off, but still, it's kind of a zone, 21, 40, 50, you no. Know? And then here we went fly, we flew above, and then we retraced, but it was bouncing above, and then we never saw it again because it was a launch pad. And now if we come back down, and obviously silver is, is weaker than gold, normally on the way down, I just feel like uh, by the time we get to this horizontal zone, it will also be the ascending zone, you know? So for me, silver 2150-ish. Obviously depends on interest rate, the dollar, what the market's doing, but you know, just silver's chart alone. 
gold. Um, gold, gold, gold. Yeah, 1900, nice number, but we're going to go lower. I just feel like 1880, but definitely otherwise 1860. And by then we've lost, we, we've already lost the settings support. So let me just draw that in already. 18, I mean, I'll just say that now, 1860, I don't think it goes below. And, you know, visiting 1855 doesn't count if it closes above 1860. 1860, otherwise 18... 80-ish, mid-1880s. That's kind of, and that would be like visiting 1900 flushing. That's where it will hover around 1880s. So those are my zones. And now I'm going to get rid of all this crap, which is just annoying me. By the time we visit 2000, we're not going to be stopping off at these mini levels, that's for sure. Uh, this one, maybe something like this. That's a bit cleaner. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Now let's look at the miners. Miners have also lost their ascending, the GDX. The GDXJ did a while ago, it's a bit like gold and silver. Actually, no, it's not silver, didn't lose its ascending. But look, you can see, let's go back to GDX. You can see how the prior support, so $30 acted as resistance. It went above and then we closed. It's not the best close at all. And this is with gold and silver doing okay. But you know, here the GDX, GDXJ, you could see that the market being down did not help. And um, so, you know, despite gold and silver being up, didn't help. They were basically flat slash red. So it's weak. Well, it makes sense. You know, if it's going to go lower, this would make sense. So I just think we're going to go lower. Where do we go? GDX, very simple, very quick, straight to here. That's That should be decent support. Nice number, 28. Also, clear resistance and support. Also, the close of a gap down here. Will we get to this gap closed? Maybe. Sorry, 28.50 to 28. Yeah, so we probably will get to 28 and close the gap. As for GDX, I don't think that's unreasonable. If we go below that, then we've got this uh, 26, whatever it is, 70 zone. The absolute low of here. I don't think we're going to get there for a while. So let's see if we get to 28.50. How much of a drop is that? 4%. That can be done in one bad day or, or two slightly bad days. Yeah, that could happen. Definitely if gold is visiting 1900 or flushing below it. If silver's at its ascending support, you'd expect the miners to be down here. Let's see how the market and the dollar affect the miners. It's all about the market, uh, the, the dollar and and the market and obviously interest rates, which coincide with those two. GXJ, for me, well, I missed it. You can see this is actually a zone right where we are. But if we flush this low here from uh, from Thursday, I would say for some reason 34 seems to be like a midway point. You can see here. Can you see that there? That's pretty neat, actually. So it would have to be a bit of a pit stop, whatever happens. We are kind of at a zone for GDXJ, but look, I think the, the gold and silver are going to go lower. I think the dollar will soon venture higher, 104. The market, I see it's going lower, but I don't think that will help gold and silver too much. So the point is, I see gold, silver, and the miners going lower, and I see this zone, 34 for GDXJ. And if we go lower than that, then absolute lows. Down here, 32, 30, I've had this line in for ages, so it comes back to relevance. Okay, normally I would end it there, but actually Bitcoin, and it is Sunday, Bitcoin, you cannot ignore, look at this, just zooms up after the ETF, uh, what is it, BlackRock, Fidelity, the usual suspects, and it just pumps up, you can see why it found support where it did. You know, this was the high from back in 2022, August 2022, the rally. And then we ran it again, hit that, and then we pumped. This is when it looked like it was collapsing. And this was the bank crisis. Bitcoin out of nowhere just benefits from it. You know, it looked ugly back here. This head and double top, head and shoulders, whatever you want to call it, just flushed. And then straight away zooms up based on surprise news, bank failures. Hits the 30,000 zone, nice and psychological, but also the high from back here. 
and then starts to make lower lows, lower highs, but then revisits this zone, 25,000, and then out of nowhere, again, surprise news, ETF, fidelity, and up it goes, and now we're here again. And now it looks good again, and now I think it will just fizzle a little bit, but you know what, not that much. I don't think we go all the way here just to fizzle out and go all the way back down. I think we fizzle a little bit, and to be honest, I think we go higher. I don't want it to go higher because I own a decent amount of high, but I really want it to be more. And actually, I wanted to buy different crypto miners to spread it out. I don't like to have just one stock, you know, in case something is wrong with that stock. I've learned from gold miners, spread it out. You know, I wanted to buy Hut, um, Bitfarm, maybe a bit of Riot and Mara, the big boys, but I wanted maybe four or five crypto miners instead of a high, which is done great this week. But yeah, I wanted a collapse in the crypto miners. I'm talking about 15,000 or lower to add to those. But um, yeah, I do think that Bitcoin looks good here. It is at resistance though. So it's I wouldn't be buying here. I, I've actually been trimming a little bit of high just under 4, 399. But I think a bit of retracement and it should go higher, but Let's see. I'm not going to be adding to anything. I do actually wish it goes lower. I've trimmed a little bit and I want to buy more. But I, honestly, I haven't thought about this at all, even up until this video. If we start to break out, then yeah, the absolute high of this, this zone here, I guess 32,500 should be decent resistance. You can see that's the absolute obvious support zone of this zone and resistance from here. We haven't reached that zone. We're still at 31,000 ish, but 32,500. Maybe visit that and then come back down to sending. I don't know. But if we actually clear 32,000, 33,000, then, then it's 40. Very simple 40, 38, 40. Anyway, we're far from that, but it's definitely worth paying attention and showing some respect to Bitcoin because um, everything else doesn't look great. It's really gas and Bitcoin. Anyway, that'll do for now. I'm back from holidays. I will be doing more quality videos now with the editing, the timestamps. I'll try and do some new things also. But yeah, back to the regular scheduled um, quality and programming.